Well, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Since word explosion ended, I think tonight I'm going to begin my message with the word finally. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. And I'll be honest, I haven't taught this in many years, but I just feel prompted in my heart tonight to go to this text. When we come to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 14. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. When we come to Ephesians 6 and verse 10, Paul begins with the word finally, which is the Greek phrase toi lopon, which means now for the rest of the matter. One expositor has said it could be translated, I've saved the most important issue to the end of the text, so if you remember nothing else, this will stay in your mind now finally to the most important matter at hand. And Paul then begins to speak about spiritual warfare. And I want you to particularly look at verse 12 where he says, for we wrestle not, and if you have your ink pen or your pencil tonight, either underline or circle this word wrestle in verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I want you to particularly notice in verse 12 that one word is repeated over and over and over again, and that is the word against. The word against appears five times in verse 12. And this is so important in this verse that if you have a pen or a pencil, you should underline or circle every time this word against is used. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, you have to keep in mind that when Paul was writing his epistles, he was writing to a Greek and a Roman world. And Paul very frequently used words which they understood that we don't totally comprehend. And one of those words is the word wrestle in the beginning of verse 12. We live in a world where we have a particular understanding of what it means to wrestle. But in fact, the Greek word that is used here is not the word wrestle at all. It is the Greek word pale, and if you're taking notes, it's spelled P-A-L-E. The word pale means combat or struggle, and it is a derivative of a specific place which was in every major city, which was called the palestra. Palestra, this is the word pale. Pale is what happened in the palestra. And so for you to understand this verse, you've got to step into history just a little bit to get the picture which Paul had in his mind when he began to discuss spiritual warfare. The palestra was a huge athletic complex which was located in all the great metropolitan cities. It was very different from the gymnasium, the gymnasium was a place where young students trained and prepared and studied and physically exercised. But the palestra was a house of combat sports primarily for three different types of athletic activities. And I want you to write these down. First, they had wrestling. Secondly, they had boxing. And thirdly, they had a sport which was called pancration. None of these sports exist in the world today. Not even that form of wrestling, not even that form of boxing, and we have nothing similar to Pancration. So I want to explain to you what these are. Because when Paul's readers saw this word wrestle, which in Greek is the word pale, they all understood exactly what he was talking about. Because right down the street was the palestra where these particular kinds of athletic practices took place every day of the week. They did not need the explanation, which I'm giving to you right now. It's, for instance, if I said the word football, I wouldn't have to stop and explain what is football because we are a 
football culture. This was a culture where there was the palestra. So let me explain just for a moment about these three different kinds of sports. First, there were wrestlers. But the wrestlers were not like our wrestlers. You fought until one lived and one died. There were no rules to the game. It was permitted to snap fingers, to gouge eyes, and a very favorite tactic was to get behind the other wrestler, grab him by the waist, throw him up in the air, snap his back, and throw him on the ground. That is the way they wrestled. So when we think about Roman wrestling especially, we're talking about something that was very brutal and very fierce. That was the first sport which took place in the palestra. The second sport was boxing. And their boxing was not like our boxing. Just like the wrestlers, boxing very often was fatal. A boxer would take leather and would begin to wrap it from his elbow all the way down his arm, all the way across his wrist, across his hand, across his knuckles, so that his entire arm was covered by leather. Then where every knuckle is, there was affixed, embedded into the letter, leather, a nail which was serrated like the blade of a knife. And the nail could be between one inch or three inches long. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Friday the 13th or Freddy Krueger, but if you just kind of keep that in your mind, that is what it looked like when boxers boxed. And in fact, when you look at the vases of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, and these are abundant, you can see them in museums all over the world, they depicted everything about their sports on their pottery. And when you see their wrestlers, you can see the wrestlers using their thumb to gouge the eye out of a fellow wrestler so he would no longer be able to see. You can see the wrestlers snapping the fingers back on other wrestlers. You can see the wrestlers with a grip behind the other wrestler throwing him in the air to snap his back. And then you see the pictures that are depicted of boxers. And these are bloody. Blood pouring from the face, their ear gone, half of their nose missing because the men that they were boxing had serrated nails attached to every one of their knuckles this was a fight to the death. And they were so committed to win that we actually have a historical record of one boxer from the first century, exactly from the time when Paul was writing this text, who was hit so hard in his mouth by another boxer that it knocked out all of his front teeth. But rather than spit his teeth out and let the other boxer know he had been hurt, he chose to swallow his teeth. And I really like that because if you've served the Lord very long, you know there comes a time when you just got to swallow your teeth and keep going. It doesn't do any good to sit down and throw a pity party. It does not change the fact that you are in a fight. Can somebody say amen to that? And then there was the third sport, and the third sport was called pancration. The word pan means everything. The word kratos is the Greek word for power. And when you compound these two words together, it becomes the word pancration, which is those who have more power than anyone else. And in fact, these were the men who survived the wrestling match. They survived the boxing match. And now the champions had come together and pancration. These were the men who had more might, more power than all the rest of them. But when they fought... They fought with clubs that were affixed with nails. They fought with the most deadly of weapons. Pancration was a messy, messy conflict. And when it was finished, they literally were carrying the bodies out of the ring. All of that is inside this word wrestle. 
Now, how many of you can see that's a very different image than the word wrestles? And so when Paul wrote and said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, he immediately uses a word which brings all kinds of graphic images into the minds of his readers. They see wrestlers, they see boxers, they see pancreatus, they see blood, they see gore. This is a back-snapping, eye-gouging, blood-spilling event. That is the word which Paul used so instantly they stood to attention and understood that whatever he is about to describe is very serious. Now, how many of you know that we have the victory in Jesus? This church is called a victory. You better know that we have the victory in Jesus. But that does not negate the fact that we have to be spiritually prepared for conflict. And that is why Paul used this word. He was alerting his readers. He was alerting us that the devil is very serious about what he does. And if we enter into the fray unprepared, we will suffer the consequences. If we have not disciplined ourselves, if we have not prayed, if we have not read our Bible, if we have not walked in obedience and done those things which God has required of us, then probably we are not going to be fit for the conflict which will confront us at some point along the way. Like it or not, the devil is real. This is not a fantasy. It is not a fable. He is real. And in fact, in this verse, the King James Version says, for the wrestle is not against flesh and blood. The Greek uses a particular word which says the, the wrestle is to us, implying that every one of us at some point in our life, whether we like it or not, we are going to be pulled into a confrontation with invisible forces which have been marshaled against us. And then Paul begins to speak by divine revelation. It is almost as though the veil of the spirit realm has been separated and Paul sees into the realm of the Spirit. And by revelation, he begins to describe how Satan's kingdom is aligned militarily. He says, for our wrestle, the one that we're drawn into, is literally what the Greek says, is not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is a diversion. It's a facade. It's a front for the real action. Working behind the flesh and blood, Paul says there are principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. The word principalities is the Greek word archos from the Greek word arche. It describes those who hold the chiefest seats of power and have held them from ancient times and it was a word used in the military to describe the highest-ranking generals, those who had the highest seats of power. Directly under them, he mentions a second category, which he calls powers. The word powers is the Greek word exousias. It describes those which have received license from the ones above. They have received license and authority to do whatever they want to do, wherever they desire to do it, also a military term. And then thirdly, he mentions rulers of the darkness of this world. And rulers of the darkness of this world in the Greek text is the word kosmokrateros, and this is a very strange word, very strange. And in fact, it is the only time this word is used in the New Testament. And the first time I studied this phrase, rulers of the darkness of this world, I was studying Greek at the University of Oklahoma. And when I studied this word, I was so confused by this word. It was back in the days of Derek Prince and Don Basham and all those Fort Lauderdale guys. And people were talking about deliverance and the book Deliverance from Evil was so popular. And I mean, demons were the rage back in those days. But I had never heard anybody 
teach on this word, cosmokrateros, rulers of the darkness of this world. And when I studied it in Greek, it's one of those words that only has one meaning, and so you can't confuse what it means. I love those kinds of words. There's no confusion. You just have to figure out how it fits into the text. And this phrase, rulers of the darkness of this world, the Greek word cosmokrateros is a compound of two words. The word cosmos, maybe you've heard the word cosmos, it describes sometimes the universe, but the Greek word describes the universe or something that is arranged or something that is orderly. The other word is kratos, the word for power. When you compound the two words together, it's cosmokrateros, which describes raw power, which has been harnessed, it has been disciplined and focused. And it was the word used by the Greeks for a boot camp or a training center. All of these words in this verse are military words. Well, think about what is a boot camp. A boot camp is a place where you take raw power, young men. You harness them. You discipline them. You put weapons into their hand and you teach them. Then send them out. And when I first saw this word, rulers of the darkness of this world, the Greek word cosmokrateros, I remember sitting at my desk in Walker Tower at the University of Oklahoma, room 535. That's the room that I lived in. And it was like revelations were going off in my face. And I said, this word can only mean that the devil trains spirits in the same way that we would train soldiers to do combat. That's the only thing this word could mean. And I begin to ask people, have you ever heard any teaching on this? I couldn't find anyone who could even make a comment on this verse, on this word. And so I decided to put it on the shelf and just wait till a later time when I would understand that word, cosmocrateros, rulers of the darkness of this world. And then years passed, And Denise and I were ministering in Enid, Oklahoma. And at the end of a service, we called for people to come forward who needed to be healed. And a man and his wife came to the front. He had his hands in his pockets. And she had her hands behind her back, standing side by side. They were from a denominational church. They really didn't even believe in healing, and they didn't even know how they ended up in the front for the prayer line. They were very perplexed about standing there. So they hadn't heard anything in a charismatic circle to make up something strange. These were just good denominational people who found themselves standing in a prayer line. And I said, well, obviously you need healing or you wouldn't be standing here. How can I pray for you? And the man pulled his hands out of his pockets. And when he put his hands in front of us, his hands were so deformed. It looked like his fingers had grown back into his hand and they were protruding from the other side of his palm. Such twisted perverted hands, both of them identical. And I said, sir, what happened to you? He said, well, you may not believe me. He said, I'm going to tell you what I told the doctor. He said, I felt something come on my hands. I felt it. He said, my hands begin to hurt. He said, then they begin to diagnose me with a rare form of arthritis. He said, look at the surgeries they performed on my hands. And I could see where they had performed surgery on his hands. He said, it didn't matter what they did to try to help me. They could not stop the twisting of my hands and my fingers. And he said, you know, wanna, you want to hear something interesting? He said, when my hands were totally deformed, I felt that thing lift off of me and leave me. 
Well, standing next to him was his wife. She was standing with her hands behind her back. I said, and why are you here? She said, well, there's another part of the story that he didn't tell you. She said, when that thing lifted off of him, it came on me. And she pulled her hands out from behind her back, and her hands were identical to her husband's hands. And in one second, it was like the Holy Spirit reached all the way back to my early years of studying Greek and grabbed that word cosmokrateros. That's the way he communicates with me. And right in front of me, I saw this and I understood. This was a spirit of affliction who had been trained to do one particular type of affliction. And when it was finished doing what it did to one, it dislodged and moved on and did exactly the same thing to the next person. That's why there are spirits of cancer. That's all they do. They move from one person to the next person to the next person, and I'm convinced they roam around hospitals. There are spirits, all kinds of spirits, there are spirits of perversion. There are spirits of confusion. That's what they are trained to do. And if you look at the phrase, rulers of the darkness of this world, with this in mind, the Greek word cosmokrateros, it really makes sense because the Greek word describes soldiers, raw power, that are trained, they're harnessed, they're disciplined, and then they are sent forth with a specific skill. And the reason I find this so important is because it tells me Satan is not haphazard about what he is trying to do to the human race. This deception that is attempting to come across the whole United States at this moment is nothing accidental. This is something demon spirits have been trained to do and they've been working on for generations. And then finally, Paul says, spiritual wickedness in high places. The word wickedness is the word poneros. It means malevolent. It shows how insidious they are. High places is a little bit of a misconception because we immediately think it's way up in the universe or up in the clouds, but in fact, high places is the Greek word eros. It describes the air we breathe, and in Greek, it is the air below the mountaintops. And the early church fathers wrote about this verse that the lower, denser regions of the air are thickly populated, that is an exact translation, thickly populated with unseen spirits which have been marshaled against us for our destruction. So now when you look at this verse, to my eyes, I saw it completely different. Satan is so serious about his victimization of the human race because we're made in the image of God. He hates that image. And he's so serious about the victimization of the human race that he has aligned his authorities like an army. There are principalities, there are powers, there are rulers of the darkness of this world, and finally, spiritual wickedness in high places or evil, malevolent spirits which have been dispatched into the lower, denser regions of the air. These are the spirits like troops that have been sent forth. And I told you one word appears in this verse. How many times? Five times. What word is that? The word against. Now, in Greek, there are several words you could use. The word anti means what? Against. And you know, I would have thought that Paul would have used the word anti in this verse. He does not use that word. It never appears in this verse. He uses the word pros, P-R-O-S. The Greek literally says, for our wrestle is not pros, flesh and blood. It's not pros, principalities, pros, powers, pros, rulers of the darkness of this world, pros, spiritual wickedness in high places, pros, 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 pros. Five times this word appears in this verse. Now in Scripture, when you find one word or one truth that is repeated quickly over and over and over and over, you better pay attention to that because the Holy Spirit is trying to drive a point home to you. 
This word pros describes very intimate conduct. Very intimate conduct. And in fact, it is so intimate, it is the very same word used in John chapter 1 verse 1 to describe the relationship between God the Father and the Son. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? With God. That word with is the same word, the word pros. It describes the pre-incarnation of Jesus, that before Jesus even came to the earth, the Father and Jesus were so close, they were prostontheon, is what the Greek says. Jesus was in the very face of the Father. They were so close, they could nearly feel each other's breath breathing upon each other's face. It is the picture of intimacy between members of the Godhead. And now Paul takes that same word and he uses it to describe the kind of contact that we're going to run into at some point along our life, like it or not, with principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. It literally means our wrestle, our combat, our intense struggle is not against flesh and blood, but pros, face to face with principalities. Pros, shoulder to shoulder with powers. Pros, rib cage to rib cage with rulers of the darkness of this world, and finally, pros, as close as possible, intimate contact. This is very close combat with spirits which have been dispatched into the lower, denser regions of the air. Those spirits which have been trained in various forms of sickness, various forms of perversion, and then they're dispatched. And their motto is in John 10, 10, they go forth saying, kill, steal, destroy. And now you understand why we need spiritual armor. <laughs> and praise God we have it. We have spiritual armor. In fact, look at the following verse. Verse 13, he says, Wherefore, do you see that word wherefore? The word wherefore in Greek is diatalto, literally translated in light of what I have just said to you. So now that Paul has gotten their attention, now he's going to tell them what they need to do. Wherefore, diatalto, in light of the fact that the combat is very serious, in light of the fact this is back snapping, eye gouging, blood spilling, this is a very serious contact, in light of the fact the contact is close, in light of the fact of principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spirits which have been dispatched into our sphere. Wherefore, in light of these things, take unto you the whole armor of God. Underline that phrase, take unto you. In Greek, it is the word ana labete. Now, what church was he writing to? Ephesus. The most mature, the biggest of all the churches in the first century. It was the model church. It was a missionary church. There was no church more legendary than the church of Ephesus. But yet Paul says to them, to this very mature church, wherefore, in light of all of these things which I have just said unto you, take unto you the Greek word ana labete. Labete means take it, take it now, do it with urgency. The word ana, a little prefix, means repeat the action like you used to do it or pick up your weaponry and wear it like you used to wear it. Which means now this great mature church was standing with all of its weaponry laying on the ground around their feet. Well, you know, if your head is filled with information, but you don't have a sword in your hand 
then you are standing naked in front of the enemy. That explains why in chapter 4 they were lying, they were stealing, they had wrath, they had bitterness, they were grieving the Holy Spirit. This was a church who knew it all, but they were not walking in what they knew. We see this in Revelation chapter 2 when Jesus tells them they had left their first love. The word left literally means you've let it slip through your fingers, perhaps in the busyness of it all, or maybe they just fell into a Christian routine. Remember, this was the church of Ephesus, which had had a major revival just 30 years earlier. You know, it only takes about 30 years for a move of God to die. Are you listening to me? It takes about 30 years. By that time, there's a second generation. People fall into a church habit. They no longer even talk to themselves as though they're believers or Christians. They call themselves churched. What in the world does that mean, churched? Churched people. And now the church of Ephesus that had known the fire of God and had repented in the middle of a major move. Paul says to them, Wherefore, here's the explanation for what's going on in their church. Wherefore, in light of the fact the devil is very serious about his victimization of you, wherefore, in light of all of these things, take unto you, Anna, do it like you once did it. Pick it up, Labete, put it back on again. You're standing naked in front of the enemy. Pick it up, put it on, repeat what you once did. Take unto you the what armor? The whole armor of God. Now, why in the world did Paul use armor as a picture of our spiritual equipment? Why did he use that example? Very easy. He was chained to a Roman soldier. He had spent years chained to a Roman soldier. God will speak to you through your environment. The first book that Paul ever wrote was 1 Thessalonians. And if you read 1 Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians, it's interesting that he writes about spiritual weaponry, spiritual armor, but it's very abbreviated and not very developed. You can see that his revelation about spiritual weaponry is beginning. But by the time that you come to the book of Ephesians, after he has walked with God for many years and has been chained to a soldier for many years, his whole concept of spiritual weaponry has grown and grown until finally we have the whole list. Every day he looks and sees the Roman soldier with his loin belt. He sees the breastplate. Every day he sees that soldier with all of his weaponry. And there were seven pieces of weaponry. There was the loin belt. Wish I had time to teach that, but that was the most important piece of all the weaponry. There was the breastplate, there was the shield, there was the sword, there was the helmet, there were the shoes which really looked like boots made out of steel, and there was a lance. And when you put all of that together, that's what we call the whole armor. And a Roman soldier was not complete if he did not have all of those pieces. And when you read Ephesians chapter 6, we find God doesn't give us some of the armor. He gives us all of the armor so we can be covered from head to toe. Some of these weapons are offensive. Some of them are defensive. Now, of course, every Roman soldier was a different size. Just like we're all different sizes here. And most of us wish that we were somebody else's size. <laughs> that means there was no such thing as one size fits all. For example, faith. Sometimes people say, oh, I just wish I had enough faith. I wish I had as much faith as Sister Sharon has. Don't worry about how much faith Sister Sharon has. The Bible says God has given to every man 
the measure of faith. You have enough faith to make sure you are covered. And a great example of this is the shield of faith. Do you know that every shield was not the same size? When you came into the Roman infantry, they measured you. They took your dimensions. And they made a shield appropriate to your size. It covered you from side to side and from top to bottom. If the guy next to you was bigger, his size was going to be a different, his shield was going to be a different size. But every man received a shield which was appropriate for what he needed. And likewise, God has given you everything that you've needed. You've got a shield. You're covered from side to side, and you're covered from the top to the bottom. Don't worry that somebody else got something more than you. You are fully covered. But when you put all these pieces of weaponry together, how much do you think they weighed? All right, write it down. If you include all their weaponry, and if you include the backpack, which every Roman soldier was required to carry, all of that equipment together weighed between, depending upon your size, 75 and 125 pounds. So let me ask you a question. If I suddenly came to this precious brother right here and I dumped 125 pounds on him and told him to get up and run around the room, could you do it? He says he couldn't do it. If you could do it, you think you might do it with trouble? Oh, yeah, he says. All right, what if I dumped 75 to 125 pounds on you and then told you to go out and fight somebody with all of that? Think that you could do it? No. All right, let's move to our sister. How about you? 75 to 125 pounds, just load it down on you. How would you do? You probably wouldn't do too good. I probably wouldn't do too good. Most of us probably couldn't get out of the chair. And that explains why Paul begins this text in verse 10 and verse 11 with the subject of power. You can't even function in spiritual warfare unless you have received the power of God. That's why he begins with the subject of power before he ever touches the subject of weaponry. Finally, my brethren, be what? Strong in the Lord. That word strong is the word in duo. It's where we get the word for an endowment. The word in means in, like to put something inside something. The word duo is where we get the word for power, explosive power. When you put the two words together, the word strong in duo describes power, but this is not a free-floating power that just floats throughout the universe. This is a specific power which has been designed to be placed inside something. It's power which is designed to be fitted into a receptacle. It fits inside a vessel of some kind. Paul says, you, speaking to the church, be strong. You've been made for this. There is a divine power which has been made to be placed inside you. And then he says, be strong. What's the next three words? In the Lord. Everybody say that, in the Lord. In the Lord. This is called the locative case. We also find it in Ephesians chapter 1 where the Bible says we are in Christ, in Christ, in Him, in whom, in Christ. How many of you know that we are in Christ? 
Do you know that case that is used every time it says that we are in him is a case which means we are perpetually in him. We are locked inside him. That's why Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. We have been placed in Christ and that's where we are. Now this phrase, be strong in the Lord, is also the locative case. This power which we're talking about can only be found in the Lord. You can't get it anywhere else. You can't get it outside of Christ. Well, the good news is, according to Ephesians chapter 1, we are in him we are locked in him and the power is locked in him which means theoretically we are baptized in power we are surrounded by power we are breathing power god has made it where it is so very simple for us to receive what we need we are in christ this power is in christ and god wants us just to reach out by faith and apprehend this power and suddenly we're felled. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now hang on. In the power of his might. Are power and might the same thing? You ever thought about that? And the power of his might. The word power is the word kratos, which describes demonstrated power. It was the same kind of power that parted the Red Sea. It was the same kind of power that created the universe. It was the same kind of power which raised Jesus from the dead. This is not power that you just theoretically believe in. This is power you can see, you can touch, you can feel. It does something. Demonstrated, manifested power. But this verse says, be strong in the Lord and in the manifested, demonstrated power of His might. Whose might? His. And who does who do refer to? To the Lord. The word might is the word iskuos. These words don't even sound the same. The word power, kratos, might iskuas, iskuas is the word for a mighty man. This is like a bodybuilder, someone that is strapped with muscles. You look at him in amazement because he is a solid piece of muscle. And that is the word which Paul uses to describe God, which is why I always stop at this point to say God is really Mr. Universe. Now, what kind of might do you think God has? If you could see the mighty arm of God, what do you think the arm of God would look like? The Bible talks about the arm of the Lord. What do you think the arm of the Lord looks like? And now in some way which Paul does not elaborate, he tells us that when we are endued with power, when we are made strong in the Lord, suddenly we've got a power working in our life that comes with manifestation. We pray, for instance, in the name of Jesus. But something mighty happens as the arm of God moves behind the scene. Verse 11. Put on. Everybody say put on. Put on what? The whole armor of God. Okay. Okay. How do you put on the whole armor of God? If we've got this battle out there, if the devil is this serious and he's arranged his forces so strategically and now God's provided all this weaponry, how do we put it on? Some people say, every morning when you wake up, reach over and 
put on your helmet. Well, friends, I just have to tell you, I am too intelligent to sit on the side of my bed and go through the motions like I am putting on indivisible clothes. You think just going through those movements and just going like this is going to put something on your head? All right. I'm going to put on my breastplate. You know, it might help you mentally recognize what God has given you, but that's not going to put anything on you. The word put on. Put on. Are you ready for this? It is the word in duo, which is translated as the word power in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, what? I'm sorry, it's translated the word strong. Be strong. Remember that power? I said it's not free-floating power, but it's power which is designed to be placed in us. The very same word is now used in verse 11 where it's translated put on. It's the word endowment. When you are endued with power, that is what puts the armor on you. As long as you're walking in the power of God, you are dressed in the whole armor of God. But the day you break your fellowship with the Lord and step into sin, you have just stepped out of your defense. As long as you are walking in that divine power, you will be clothed with this armor. Your armor depends on your relationship with God. As long as you're in relationship, as long as you are in fellowship, as long as you are participating in his power in you, you've got a helmet on your head, a breastplate on your chest, a loin belt around your waist, a sword and a shield in your hands, Shoes on your feet, and you've got a lance riding down the back of your spine. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then we jump back to verse 12 where we started. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now I'm going to end with a story about something we learned years ago. Back when our ministry first started, like every ministry, and actually still like today, we were really believing God to get started financially. Things were going fine. We're having meetings. Back in those days, we were preaching 400 times a year. Can you imagine that? Different churches. We were selling our books as fast as we could print them. I mean, we were having meetings. The money was coming in. Things were starting to grow. And then all of a sudden, with no logical explanation, our finances dried up. We weren't doing anything different. I mean, weird things begin to happen, including pastors who stole our offerings. Um, I mean, just strange things started happening. It was like Denise and I came under assault. And I would sit at that table with my calculator back in the days when people used calculators that had tape. And I'd punch in those numbers trying to figure out how in the world to resolve this situation. And I would wrestle with that calculator. The next day I'd wrestle with that calculator, wrestle with those numbers. And it didn't matter how I put those numbers in, they always came out red on the tape. There was no way I could see how to resolve this problem. And I found that the number one thing I prayed about was, can anybody, can anybody say it? Money. In fact, you would have thought that that was God's name. Every time I looked up, I said, money, <laughs> money. And 
Now, one day when I was praying, the Lord said, you do not have a money problem. I said, then what kind of problem do I have? Three times, he said, you do not have a money problem. I said, then what kind of problem do I have? I cannot pay my bills. I don't know what's happened. We haven't done anything differently. And suddenly, it's like somebody has turned off the spout. Everything has dried up. What kind of problem do I have? And the Holy Spirit instructed me to go to Mark chapter 4. So turn quickly to Mark chapter 4. This will just take a moment. Mark chapter 4. And I turned to Mark chapter 4. Verse 35. And the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let's pass over to the other side. And when he had sent away the multitude, he took them, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were with him also other little ships. Verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and did what? Rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. But look, if you would, back at verse 37, there arose a great storm of wind. Arose is the Greek word genomai, which means out of nowhere. It was the last thing we would have expected. Completely took us off guard. Of course, these were professional fishermen. They knew the weather of the sea. This was a perfect night for sailing. When they began the trip, they thought it was going to be an easy trip. When suddenly genomai, out of nowhere which tells us this was not a rainstorm, this was not a thunderstorm, this was something unexpected, something they did not anticipate. There arose a great storm of what? Wind. The word wind is the word lelesi. It describes turbulence in the atmosphere. This is not a rainstorm. This is wind. This is disturbance. You can feel it, but you cannot see it. And the waves began to beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. Now here they were, bailing water, binding waves, bailing water, fighting waves. Finally, somebody said, let's go get Jesus. He was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him. Funny that the word awoke is the same word for resurrection. They didn't just gently say, please, Jesus, help us. They jerked him off of this pillow. This was urgent. And they said, Master, don't you care that we perish? And he arose, and what? He rebuked the wind. What had they been fighting all night? The waves. The waves. The waves. We read in verse 37, the waves beat into the ship. The Greek means over and over and over, one wave after another wave after another wave, monster waves. They are fighting waves, waves, waves. Finally, they wake Jesus up and say, Jesus, the waves! He arises, lifts his voice, and begins speaking to the wind. What have they been fighting? 
the waves. And when the Bible says he rebuked, just give you a little hint, the word rebuke is a translation of a Greek word. Jesus never said, I rebuke you. <laughs> it means to deride, to disparage. It means to intimidate, to insult. Jesus began speaking to the wind like it was an entity. He began to speak against it. He began to deride it. He began to chide it. He was speaking to the wind like it was a personality. And when he was finished speaking to the wind, then he looked downward to the waves and said, Peace, be still. The Greek is almost impossible to translate peace, be still. The idea is literally Jesus rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Shh. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And the Bible says the disciples were amazed and said to one another, what kind of man is this that he even has authority over the, what? Wind and the waves. There I was with my calculator, fighting those numbers. Could not figure out what was happening. Why could this not end? Why am I doing everything logical to fix this problem and the problem cannot be fixed? Because I did not have a money problem. My problem was the wind. There was a disturbance in the atmosphere. There was a turbulence which had been released against us. The manifestation of the turbulence was the finances. Like the disciples, it was the waves. But there was something behind the waves. And friends, if all you do is deal with your symptoms, they will repeat again and again and again and again. You need to read everything you could read. You need to use your brains. Do everything logical you can do. But if you don't deal with a root in the invisible realm. So now I go back to verse 12 and I'm going to close. Paul says, For <laughs> here's the reason why you need this power, here's the reason why you need this weapon. For we wrestle not. Our combat, our intense struggle, this thing is real. The Greek says we're drawn into it. It's not with flesh and blood. It's not with these things that you can see. And there's something working behind the scenes. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, malevolent spirits which have been dispatched into our environment. Verse 13. Wherefore? Pick it up. Put it on. You know how. You did it once. Take unto you the whole armor of God. God's given you everything that you need that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. What is an evil day? It's a day when evil tries to get in your day. <laughs> it's that simple. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could have been yesterday. When you wake up and evil has tried to invade your day, when you're dressed in the armor of God, you draw the line. And now you're in a position to resist. And so you're not crossing that line. And having done all,
stand. <sighs> what a problematic statement. I mean, it just creates theological nightmares. <sighs> Having done all, stand. Well, if you translate it literally. And if the weapons don't work, stand. Isn't that kind of what it means? If you've done everything you've been told to do and none of it works, stand. Well, friends, if the weapons don't work, if the word doesn't work, nothing works, and we just stand, we're going to be beat to a pulp. The original literally means, oh, listen to this. And having brought everything to an ultimate conclusion, having fought your fight, having fought it to the end, having done all, you began, you fought it all the way to the end, then you come to this word stand. It doesn't mean nothing else works. Just grit your lip, just grit your teeth and stand there and bear it. That word stand is God's vision of you at the end of the fights. The Greek tense literally means having brought everything to an ultimate conclusion. You will stand. Now I wonder how many of you are in some kind of a personal struggle right now. Can I see your hands? A few of you? Do you ever see yourself as a struggler? Do you ever say, dear God, please help me get through this. Jesus, you've got to help me get through this. And sometimes you get so thick in the fight that you just see yourself as a struggler, somebody just trying to make it through this. But here's the good news. God has a snapshot of you that he carries in his pockets. He can flip it out and say, see what I have? It's a picture of what you look like at the end of the fight. He knows the end from the beginning. And he doesn't see you at the end as a struggler laying slain on the ground. He sees you as one who stands, conquers, Everybody say victory. The enemy under your feet, authority over principalities and powers. You're not totally martyred laying in your blood, but you've got your foot on top of the enemy, dressed in the armor of God, standing. That's what God sees about you. He didn't see you as a struggler. My goodness, he's given you everything you need to stand. He's given you power made to go inside you. He made you as a receptacle to receive the power. God has fixed this deal so we can't help but win. He puts you in Christ so that you're where the power is. You're breathing the power. You just embrace it. And that power clothes you from head to toe. So that it's really not a matter of if we're going to win. It's just a matter of when we're going to win. Because God has already declared at the end. We stand. Now why did Paul write this text? Was he trying to spook us? Was he trying to scare us? No. He was trying to arouse us. 
that this deal is serious. And we better embrace everything he's given because there's some powers out there that have been marshaled against us. But if we'll surrender and take what God's provided, we'll end up standing. I want every head to be bowed. Pastor Sharon, I'm going to give this to you. Father, we thank you so much for this church. We thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, I ask you, I ask for me, I ask for your church. Lord, that you would forgive us for letting armor that you have provided lay around our feet. Forgive us, Father, for getting into routines and forgetting that the fight is genuine. We thank you that you have declared the end from the beginning. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to enable us, help us to do everything we can to prepare so that we will walk out of this conflict as the victors. In the precious name of Jesus. I'd like everyone just to begin to pray in tongues just for a moment. I want you to seal this in the spirit. Some of you are going to go home with answers from this tonight. You've been fighting the waves. Tonight, the Holy Spirit's saying you've got to look to the wind. You've got to deal with the invisible realm to get your victory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, in the name of Jesus, we take authority. Right now, we take authority over every foul turbulence that has come against finances. We come against all of the sickness which has come against members of this congregation. We come against the mental confusion which has tried to steal people's joy. In the name of Jesus, we come against you. I want you to see your problem in front of you. Just extend your hand toward it. And say, your hands and just begin to worship God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for peace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Oh, my goodness, I feel something mighty is happening in people's lives. Thank you, Jesus. Begin to worship him. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank 
you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Pastor Sharon, I want to give this to you. You know, that attack which came to Jesus in the middle of the night, in the middle of the sea, was a very strategic attack. It came just as he was about to arrive at the country of the Gadarenes, where there was a de demoniac that needed to be delivered. Most attacks are strategic. Churches usually don't have problems till they get in a building program. It's when they're on the brink of something magnificent that the enemy attacks. He'll let you get along for a long time and wait till you're on the edge of something great. And then suddenly, get on my out of nowhere, there arise a great storm of wind. But my friend Jesus made it to the other side. And you're going to make it to the other side where God's power is going to be in demonstration. You just can't stop along the way and sink. You've got to take authority over the wind and the waves and say to your spouse, hey, we're here on the breakthrough of the greatest thing we've ever done in our life where this attack would not be occurring. This is strategic because the devil knows we're on the brink of something magnificent. Stir yourself up. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Keep your eyes on the other side. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. If you would like to receive more information about Rick Renner Ministries, please visit us at renner.org. Start your day on the path towards success and peace as you discover something new from God's Word with Rick Renner's outstanding devotional, Sparkling Gems from the Greek. You may purchase a copy of Sparkling Gems on our website or check us out on iTunes. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. With your support, we will continue to teach, strengthen, and rescue lives in need. Together, we can make a difference.